You understand what I'm trying to do? And because they see how close I am to succeeding, where a lot of other so-called black leaders fail, there's a concentrated effort to stop them. They'll do anything to stop us, especially now. Because where is our opposition? In other words, like it says, who can stand against us now? Who can? We went to a battle with demons in Putnam County. And we warred against these devils, am I right? They did everything in their power to take this land and make sure that what's happening right now does not go on. They tried every trick in the book. They ain't finished. They tried slander, defamation of character. They tried to lock brothers up, harass sisters on the street, stop every car coming down and make sure. They did everything they could and not one person come out and help us. Why? Because they had us marked as a cult. Oh, there's some crazy suicide cult. Reverend Dr. Malachi Z. York, author and scholar of over 408 books, and lecturer on various subjects, teacher of religion and culture in ancient civilizations of over 40 years. Raising the consciousness of his people, Dr. York's progressive solution for Nubians in America led to the success of living for and by each other through their culture and way of life. Three major communities were born, developed from Brooklyn, New York, the Catskills Mountain, New York, and Eatonton, Georgia thus the presence of Nuwabians. With 476 acres of undeveloped land owned by the tribe, Nuwabians stood in the way of a 20-year municipal plan of the Eatonton officials. In late 1997 through 1998 AD, Eatonton town officials disrupted the progressive growth of the Nuwabian community with bogus planning and zoning violations, preventing them from building their Egyptian-style theme park. Since 1998 AD, one zealous sheriff, Howard Richard Seals, would spearhead a frivolous investigation of false allegations of child molestation and later racketeering charges of illegally structuring money against Malachi York and the Nuwapian community. Malachi York's interest lies in uplifting Nubian people in the Western Hemisphere. He even went beyond the hearts and minds of touching Caucasians, Latinos, Asians, and American Indians. His charitable works extend to youth sponsorships and generous donations, civil rights supported issues and concerns. And under the Al Mahdi Shrine Temple, his humanitarian efforts led to community services and hospital visits to the sick and needy all throughout the state of Georgia. York's mission consists of bringing all religions together under one roof. Students lived and practiced a full life of the three monotheistic religions, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, in its pristine purity, becoming student teachers. Men would sell and propagate books and pamphlets as the women and children stayed in the community freely. Dr. Malachi Z. York is a writer and a writer of truth or I should say nonfiction. And he's just informing the world of so much that he knows. And not, not to isolate him to being just a writer, but however you put it in layman's terms or for, for everyone to overstand out there in the public, is he's a scholar. Doc was in the office most of the time. He's in the office most of the time because he's constantly working on books. I mean, he's written over 465 books. I mean, over that, you could go as far as 500 books. He's written every single one of them. And what I was able to all times to help with is he'll dictate and we'll type and then we'll put like, you know, grammatical corrections in and things like that. This is what he did day and night, all the time, writing. All the time. In the car. In the car. We're in the car and he's like, someone, he's dictating something. It was like, inf he's just like, I've got to get this, I've got to get this information to the people. And that drive is what, um, is what, is what is actually the motivation is why we've been fighting for six years and we're not stopping and we're not going to stop until he is free.
It was a communal lifestyle. You know, all of us have a certain connection and love for each other because of what he set up, Dr. Malika Azior, what he set up for us in the community. You know, when we went to public schools, we all traveled together in groups. You know what I'm saying? Everybody knew not to mess with us as children. You know, we had men and women who watched us to make sure our hair, our nails we were clean, clothes were pressed, you know what I'm saying, make sure we ate right. Dr. York is a person, of, uh, is a giving person, because uh, if you look at his record, what he did, it was always for the children. And that was our main goal out there was about the children. That's why really, we really worked the way we did and tried to build the way we did, because Everything was about the children. Malachi's vision is to raise the conscious level of Nubians worldwide. To achieve this, he always stayed firm in educating the youth through proper language and culture. The teachers that came to teach the children uh, were from overseas. We had a teacher from Morocco, a teacher from Egypt, also a teacher from Mali, uh, two teachers from Sudan, and a teacher from um, Israel. And these teachers were the best quality teachers. Um, while the children learned on the weekends, uh, the older children went to public school during the week. After they finished public school, they had to go and learn uh, different languages, cultures. He always uh, taught us to do right by ourselves, to do right by others, to be respectful. You know, he taught us the importance of exercising, the importance of uh, language, you know, the importance of education you know, the importance of growing up and having an interest instead of a want, always wanting something in life, to have an interest, to grow up, you know what I'm saying, and be productive as a person. The atmosphere, the atmosphere was, was beautiful, you know, with the children and, and just running, you know, and, and the thing about the land is um, people will come on the land with their children and like most places, you know, places you go to, they, if you go in a building or something, you know, the, the mother's holding their kids and everything, but on the land, it's like, you know, they just let them go. You know, mothers go one way, the kids go the other way. But it was, it, the atmosphere was like, we watched each other. So everybody felt safe, children were safe, and it just land for them just to run, you know, and just, you know, to be themselves, you know. He had a loving interaction with any of the children. He was very involved with what we did with the children. Like when they got good grades, he'd want to see their report cards, and everybody would get to go to Captain D's and get a treat. That's the kind of things that he would do for them, and just different surprises and parties and events. He's the kind of person who wouldn't, wouldn't just look out for one person, he'd look out for everybody. If we had holes in our shoes, or we needed socks, or, you know, whatever the case may be, you know what I'm saying, he'll help out. You know, what size shoe you wear? Like, he did that to me one time. What size shoe you wear? I'm like, uh, nine. No, I'm sorry, I wore eight at the time. He said, okay, I got something for you tomorrow. Next you know, you have a brand new pair of sneakers or shoes. You know what I'm saying? That's the kind of person he is. When we had our holidays, like Children's Day, or uh, you know what they call Halloween, we call it Prophets and Angels Day. You know what I'm saying? He made sure that everybody enjoyed themselves. His character, it was like a father. Every time he'd come into the office, he brings so much positive energy. When you're working with him, you feel like you can do anything. And he pushes you way beyond whatever your concept of what you do, what you can do, and you can do amazing things. Dr. Malakas, New York, can't be in there no more. You know, it's, it's been far too long and it's not fair for the dedication that he's done, that he has given to everyone. No man that I know of has given that much of his life, you know what I'm saying, for a group of people anywhere. Not in my lifetime, not in this day and time, you know what I'm saying? They were taking out leaders back in the 60s before I was born. He's devoted all his life, a message that has and this is how they always it. put us down, uh, make my you know? Program. They always attack anything they can, you know? Putnam County, Eatonton, Georgia, established December 12th in 1807, named after General William Eaton, a military war hero from Connecticut. The small town is known as the dairy capital of the world in honor of its major industry, dairy farming. The birthplace of noted writers Alice Walker of The Color Purple and Joe Harris, author of the Uncle Remus stories. This is their story, a people returning to their ancestral land, a small town sheriff, 
along with city officials and the federal government's concentrated effort to frame an innocent man and the character assassination of a people out of fear and cultural differences, a case left with a paper trail of loopholes. One may say the greatest conspiracy never told of the wrongful conviction of Reverend Dr. Malachi Z. York. Ninety-seven was a beautiful year for the Wabians. 1997, we had already owned the land and for the last four years, because we purchased it originally in 93, 92, 93, so it was about four or five years. We had already owned the land. Um, there was a good amount of building that had already been done. Holy Tabernacle Ministries had already built the, uh, uh, the Black Temple. And um, that was the first year that we had our Zed ceremony, a very special ceremony for us that only occurs once every 30 years. I was the first to arrive, me and Wally, we arrived in um, Putnam County in um, 93. And during that time, we were just cows on, on the land. They had cows and they had deer, so it was no, as they say, the pyramids and tamarind back then when we first got there. Being here, right, I had certain instructions to, you know, certain buildings we wanted to do, you know, the build because, you know, we had some people coming. So I had to go down to uh, Putnam County to, you know, to put in, um, you know, application for them, you know, as far as um, trying to get a permit for the different buildings to build. And we encountered a lot of problems. At first it was okay, you know, it's a house here, a house there. And then, um, you know, they get, get to realize, okay, uh, it's more than one house, it's more than two houses. So then they start, that's when our problems start. We have bought about, 100 new homes mm -hmm. so that families could live together live together if that's what they chose to do mm -hmm. but we were not allowed to put the homes up because planning and zoning um was not allowing it and we were fighting for that so because the because a lot of people wanted to live up there mm -hmm. and we had chose to live up there because we consolidate excuse me we consolidate our funds because we were trying to build mm -hmm. an egyptian theme park we start building our pyramids and a lot of things. The first building we built, right, was an exact duplicate of a building that was in Putnam County. The zoning problem started from the Wapians really at the end of 1998. Um, and end of 1998 is when we had our second uh, annual Halloween party in our social club, Remesis, because um, it had been built in 19, it had finished built in 19, fall of 1997, so uh, 1998. Uh, we had our second uh, Halloween party, and then sometime shortly after that, um, the building had gotten cited for zoning violations. The problem with that is the building had already been up and running uh, for over a year <laughs> when they originally came back and said, well, we didn't have a certificate of occupancy, which is true by law, by code. You're supposed to have a certificate of occupancy, but uh, by, by code, the next step would be for uh, the owners to, you know, contract a proper contractor, which they did, which was me, uh, as a Nwapin general contractor, it was the name of my company at the time, to go back and file the necessary paperwork for the, for the certificate of occupancy, which we did. They used that particular building to go and do an inspection of the land, and they looked at other building projects, and there may have been one or two building code violations, and they utilized that as a reason to shut down all the buildings on the land. That was an injunction that was filed, and the first injunction filed in 1999, the actual case was 99CV1-1, um, where it was an injunction placed against all of the buildings on the land, where they literally had all the buildings shut down on the land. The sheriff, uh, Howard Richard Seals, come out and do the building inspections. And we're like, he's not an inspector. Why is he doing the building inspections? You know, okay. Then he would send the building inspector to come out and come out with him. You don't know anything about building inspections. Why are you even here? I've never seen that before in my life where a law enforcement official would take the time to stop and do building inspections. No, that's just, that was just their excuse and their reason to be able to come up on the land and for him to be able to look around and search the whole property. Well, legally, it's. I mean, no sheriff is, has done that. You know, legally, that's not, you know, that's not his job. 
But the fact that he just they wanted to go under the harassment thing, he's a sheriff, he's on the land, he's and he's doing building inspector. You know what I mean? And that's not that's, that's not his job. That comes under the planning and zoning with your building inspector. They come in and, and they inspect. All your cities have that. They have what they call, you know, your planning and zoning, building inspector, or they have marshals that work for the planning and zoning. Oh, it was no doubt the sheriff was only there to, to, to seek information. His whole purpose and goal of coming was to see what he could see, what he could get into, and see what he could use against us. Like I said, he was only coming to find something he found illegal um, in any manner, any form of fashion whatsoever. That's all. That was his whole purpose. He didn't know the first thing about a building his own population. He's a sure. What does he know about building codes? What New Orleans came to realize, Putnam County officials had made plans to expand their airport and upgrade State Highway 16. Anticipating this to be the route of incoming tourists, the same highway that connects to Highway 142 runs directly in front of the Nuwabian property on 404 Shadydale Road, which means tourists before reaching the city of Eatonton would have to first pass Tamaray, Egypt of the West. It was really all about the county officials working together with other members of government in order to get us off that land because it was a it was sat right on Highway 142, which is a main thoroughfare going towards Reynolds Plantation. And Reynolds Plantation was owned by Reynolds, who was a filthy rich man, um, who had ties to the government, and they just didn't want us as their little glitch in the system. That's when our problems start. Then they start holding us back. Well, we would go down there, okay, we want to get a permit for this. Well, you can't get a permit unless you do this. So we would go back and we would do that. We come back, then they change their mind about it, and it was like a, a whole, um, whole harassment thing as uh, far as like for us building. It was always, we do whatever they say, when we come back, they change the rules. And that's, that's the way they did it. We were grandfathered in. You know, and grandfathered mean, it means anything you were doing before that 97, then you would go under the old uh, zoning law. And that's, that was the problem right there, because they, kept trying to shift us to 1997 uh, laws and say, no, we're grandfather in, just like everybody else in the county. The excessiveness of the uh, uh, actions done by Putnam County officials, and I will say it wasn't just the building inspector's office, the county commissioners in order, the, the uh, county attorney and the husband of the county attorney who pretended to be, even though it was against the law, the county attorney. Um, all these particular actions were taken to, sh to shut us down uh, and this is why the landowners at the time who was at the time not Dr. Malachi of York but it was nine individuals who were the head of the church that was on the land, Holy Tabernacle Ministries, uh, hired me and my company to go and sort out all the building and zoning violations. On June 11th of that year um, we, I, I had to go into Superior County Court and argue as to why we should be allowed to proceed on with the building projects. And at the time, uh, the county attorney was trying to have the lights turned off on the land. Mm. You know, they, their whole thing was, well, we want to turn off all the electricity, not just to the buildings that were under violation, but to the entire land, all of the developed land, which were houses, which were offices, which were, you know, stuff that already existed way, way before we got there, you know. I mean, it were mobile homes who were legal, permitted, and everything, and they wanted to shut those down also. So this is why you realize it wasn't just about us uh, uh, having to go and argue um, on behalf of the building and zoning violations. They were literally just trying to get rid of us and were using the law to their advantage or misusing the law to their advantage just to try to do whatever they could to just get us out of the land altogether. On February 21st, 2001, Reverend York was exonerated of all building and zoning violations in Putnam County, stemming from 1998 by Sheriff Seals. Reverend York resided in Athens, Georgia at this time, and the nine landowners held the deed of Tamaray. And New Wabians were thriving. One year and three months later, all was well, at least it appeared to be.
Russ, authorities came fully armed and prepared for any uh, hostilities. They came with helicopters, several SWAT teams, and dozens upon dozens of police cars and armed officers. As you can see there, authorities are now going building by building, it would appear, serving these search warrants. Here's another load of cargo going out and some trailers that they have brought onto the property. This is a very large compound covering several acres. The highlight of the compound are these Egyptian pyramids that sit at the center. We've seen authorities going in and out of those two pyramids as well. Some of the Nawabian nation remain on the grounds. Authorities, uh, SWAT teams and officers are sitting next to them as they sit on the ground over here near the shade. They have sat there for the whole hour and a half that we have been on scene. The wing watched by those FBI agents you see at the top of your screen. Authorities have also in the last half hour or so lined this compound with squad cars. Local authorities are also on the scene. As we pan out here every few feet, there is a, what appears to us to be Putnam County Sheriff's officers with squad cars just lining the area. Highway 142 is shut down. They have brought in lights. The authority, the FBI, has to flood this compound with lights as it appears they're going to be serving these warrants for quite some time. I remember walking this morning. I was walking vigorously. I remember seeing the, the sun shining on the pyramid and the statues, and it's just so beautiful. It's a big privilege to be there every day and to wake up in the morning hearing the OM chant and having such just a, a peaceful existence. Because I was a city dweller forever before I came. And to live somewhere just so peaceful and so tranquil, your mornings just started off easy. That day was, was supposed to be an exciting day to me. The reason why is because on the land, my occupation was an artist. You know, I helped decorate a lot of the monuments, painted them, did a lot of uh, exterior sculpturing of ancient Egypt and different cultures. And we had a very large project, you know, that we were working on, which was Edfu Museum. It's a, um, a, res a resurrection of an ancient um, temple, you know, in ancient Egypt. We were standing, getting some air, talking. We were talking about what we'd eaten that day and, you know, how we had eaten the right thing, we'd eaten the right time, we were feeling good. And we looked down the driveway and um, Dr. York had come in for the day to do work prior to this. And um, he had gone out uh, to get a bite to eat. So he was gone, but we heard cars, so we thinking he's back, but it was too fast for him to be back. The first thing I heard was helicopters. That's the very first thing I heard, you know? I thought not, nothing of it because, you know, a lot of time on the land, you have helicopters that swarm and get real low, you know, just to try to intimidate us because they got a problem with us. You know, you kind of get used to it. So when I heard this helicopter, I'm like, ah, it's not a big deal. It's just helicopters, you know? Heard it again, but something changed. My cousins and them was running, screaming towards the house. We looked and it was like a strange vehicle coming down the driveway, usually where he would enter and exit from his, his carport. And it was like a weird, it looked like maybe an electric van or some utility, something. We were like, what is, what's, what's going on? And we saw someone get out the vehicle with guns like this. And they were walking across the property and there were, most of the brothers um, were out at work at the time. But there were some brothers um, who were there working on it at the time we were working on it. And one of the brothers walked up and they had a gun pointed at him. As we start to walk around that corner, you saw them all start putting their hands up in the air. I'm like, why is their hands up in the air? So I could see further down, you know, because now my attention is away from where I was working and it's more towards the front of the uh, actual train station. And I saw a guy way down. I remember his face, what he was wearing. He had a white shirt on, beige pants. He had a piece of paper in his hand and he had his gun pointing towards these brothers. We came, uh, I came inside and I looked at everybody and I said, everybody calm down, we're under siege. I'm a pretty jovial person, so people are like, oh, what are you talking about, Robbie? You know, blah, blah. And it's like, no, really? They're men with guns and we are under siege. Please, everyone stay calm. You guys jump out, 
don't move, freeze. Freeze, don't move, FBI. I was like, whoa. Put my hands up, and all I had in my hand was a paintbrush. You know, literally, one paintbrush in my hands. I was still upstairs, so people run to the windows, and they're just like, oh my gosh. Look at I mean, men are in straight um, tactical uniform. I mean, gas mask, uh, bulletproof everything, shields, guns. I mean, they are going to war. I mean, you would think that we were in another country. I mean, they were, I mean, they came down on ropes from helicopters. I mean, most of the men weren't there because they had jobs. I called the office and there was no one there at the time. While we were on the phone, then there was a raid uh, on the land and I didn't know what was happening because she said, emergency, I have to go. And she quickly hung up the phone. I, I hadn't yet known what had happened that day, but people had started calling me because also, at Dr. Malakazi York's house in Athens, Georgia, it was being raided at the same time. The no-knock warrant issued by the federal had the name Dwight D. York as the resident of 404 Shady Dell Road at the Nuwabian property. The question is raised, if Malachi York, who the courts refer to as Dwight, is a resident, then why was the feds also raiding his living residence since 1998 at 155 Mansfield Court in Athens, Georgia? an hour and a half away. So I looked out there and I seen all these, all these men in black, police officers in black, and they were just running, trying to you know, circle the house, right? So I said, all right. I said, they're gonna, they're gonna bust in to myself. So when I went to the front door, right, I opened it and they were like try, uh, getting ready to bust the door down. And when they saw me, they all stopped and looked, you know, as surprised because they didn't get a chance to break the door down. So they came in, they just bum rushed me, and threw me on the ground, uh, handcuffed me and everything, you know what I mean? So, you know, I told them, I said, look, I said, it's, it's, it's a woman upstairs, she got two kids, you know, don't, you know, don't, you know, don't hurt them, that's all I was upstairs. Who's upstairs? I said, it's a woman and two kids. So they run upstairs, and during that time, the sister, she heard the commotions and she took our babies and she, you know, she hid in the, in the closet. And when they came upstairs, they, you know, they broke open the door and they pointed the guns at a little two-year-old child. And they pointed a gun at him, you know, I mean, and made her get out. A sister called me, and she had said that doc she saw Dr. York get arrested, and she wanted to know, was that true? She said because they had banged out all the windows to the car and everyone was on the ground, and she wanted, you know, to make con confirm that was him. She said, I see a black navigator, and I don't know if that's him or not, but it looks like him. I have witnesses to it. It began in the Baldwin County Mall, shopping mall in open daylight, with them knocking out the gun, knocking out the windows of a car with the butts of their guns, dragging three females as well as myself out on the floor in the glass in the streets. You follow? Yeah. And they attempted to arrest us. Nothing on that arrest warrant, to my knowledge, ever referred to me as a dangerous person, never referred to me as an armed person or armed and extremely dangerous, which would have caused for such an overuse of force in the presence of a, of a sheriff, Massey from Baldwin County, who stood right there and watched all this abuse. I couldn't see, because I was hit so fast, I was hit so fast and hit to the ground so fast, and was kept in the guns, poked at me from every direction. I wasn't allowed to look up, don't look up, don't look up, don't look up. But I did notice as I was being dragged out the car, I looked to my right, I did see Sheriff Massey from Baldwin County standing there. Two guys come, they frisk me, take anything out of my pocket, and they, they snatch me up, take me off of the ground, and took me to the other side towards where the barn was. You know what I'm saying? And just drop me on the ground. And then I could feel a gun to the back of my head. It felt like a shotgun or something. Something very, you know, that could kill me, basically. You know what I'm saying? And they strapped me. I was like, what's going on? Shut up. Don't effing say nothing. We were all afraid for our life. Literally, I have resolved in my mind, wow, I'm going to die today. Today, I'm going to die. It was very clear, very, because they have no reason to come on this property and do this to us. So while people are running, um, sister said, to, someone did say to pray, and then we just start praying, so at least we're, we die in God's favor, I mean, if anything. And that, while all this is going on, it's all happening simultaneously, because you have houses with children, babies, infants, all the way up to teenage boys and teenage girls, 
who are also, this is happening to them at the same time as it's happening to us in the office. Um, you hear a bang at the door and a big explosion type sound at the basement. They blew out the window. The office is kind of like a square. Like, I'm gonna just say it meets at this corner, like, meets at a corner like this. And there's a window right here, front door. You hear boom, an explosion, glass shatter, and women just screaming. And so we're just praying, and they're like, lay down, lay down. We're all laying down on the floor. Um, one of the sisters, she has asthma attack. Um, she was trying to breathe, trying to breathe. Man comes up the steps. It's a spiral steps to get to the second floor. He comes and he points the gun directly in her face. So she really is about to just, cause it's like, okay, this is it. I'm gonna die. So uh, he allowed her to get her inhaler. Another guy comes in and they're really embarrassed. I mean, they're sweating. It's hot. It's, they came to kill. They bought in over 200 agents. I'm talking, they flew them in from California, Washington, D.C., other cities, other counties, Atlanta. I mean, they made this a big effort. But what a lot of people don't know was the raid was planned for 3 a.m. 3 a.m. in the morning, while everybody was asleep. That's when they had planned the raid. By the grace of the Most High, it didn't happen at that time because then it definitely would have been a, 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 a slaughter, just a bloodbath, and women, children, men, women, everybody would have just been dead. And on the news, it might have been chalked up as, oh, they killed themselves, or, you know, it was a war, they, men, women, children had guns, or just something like totally insane. It would have been chalked up as that. They literally came with um, the, um, the freezer trucks and body bags, because that was what, they had expected and what they had planned for. Children are crying. Um, my daughter was like two years old at the time. And the children were made to get down on their knees with guns to their head and their hands over their head. They blew, when they blew in down to the bottom, they threw in tear gas. I'm glad that Doc wasn't here. Because the reality is that's who they were, they wanted to, to kill. Not even, it wasn't about an arrest. They were hoping he was there so that it would be some confrontation and they could take him out. And that's my uh, personal feelings on that for a raid that you plan for 3 o'clock a.m. in the morning and you come in someone's house at 3 o'clock a.m. in the morning, they're going to want to defend themselves and defend their family. So uh, that's what, what, what they expected and it didn't happen that way. Painful day. It's a painful day. It's a miracle, it's a miracle and a blessing. Dr. York survived and all of us, because that clearly was not the intent of the day. Thursday morning, May 9th, an arraignment hearing took place in Macon, Georgia before Magistrate Court Judge Hicks an original plea of not guilty was entered on the court records. They did the grand jury indictment, which is the procedure that they have to go through prior to enforcing a warrant of arrest. They have to be indicted first by a grand jury. Even at the grand jury, uh, they asked, do you have any uh, evidence? And she said, no, we have no evidence. Former Macon police officer Joseph Hibner took a special interest in launching his own investigation into the York case finding misconduct and procedural errors since day one of the grand jury indictment. Special Investigator Jelaine Ward of the Federal Bureau of Investigation stated herself she don't have a witness or a shred of evidence to prove that Dr. York transported or caused to be transported children across state lines for illicit acts. The root of the indictment. She don't have a shred of evidence to prove it or eyewitness. During the first hearing, um, the other attorney he had that was working with the Garland firm was Johnson, Senator Johnson, and he waived uh, Dr. York's speedy trial rights. That was the first uh, step done. First, his presumption of innocence was taken away from the lawyer. Now, Garland, on that first day, was actually fighting. Mm -hmm. the, what he asked them to produce was proof of jurisdiction because they were trying to prosecute Dr. York in federal and state. Right. which is unheard of because first of all there are no statutes in federal 
for child molestation. Right. Now, this is prior to the re-indictment. This is why they pulled in the RICO. So he said, you have to prove jurisdiction. The Garland firm argues the federal court has no jurisdiction to try Dr. York due to the statutes of limitations exceeding itself for child molestation and transporting minors across state lines. Most of the allegations were past a statute of limitation if they were true anyway. And then thirdly, the other counts weren't even illegal at the time where they stated these acts happened. You know what I'm saying? Initially, like the transporting of children across state lines for the purpose of illicit sex. They're saying that Dr. York caused or did transport children from New York to Georgia just to do this. So first of all, it can't be illegal in the state you're exiting from. Your charges have to be illegal in the state you're arriving in where the act supposedly took place. And we asked them. If you, in, in essence, they, they used the Man Act, which was initially set up to trap um, pimps and prostitutes. So the initial question is, okay, if you're charging him with bringing children from New York to Georgia for this purpose, then where's the person who engaged in the act? The prosecution argues from 1993 to 2002, York committed these acts from New York to Georgia. However, without a strong indictment, the U.S. Attorney Office quickly re-indicted York on federal racketeering charges under the RICO law as a criminal enterprise. They had the initial indictment, which was only four counts, which didn't involve um, racketeering, which didn't involve a whole bunch of the mess that later on, they knew that initial indictment was gonna fall in his face. So they came with a superseding indictment, what they called a superseding indictment. Superseding indictment allows you the ability to add on to your original indictment. This wasn't a superseding indictment they re-indicted Dr. York because according to the initial indictment, they were charging him with things that wasn't even a crime at the time, literally. During the illegal search and seizure of May 8th, amongst the media frenzy outside the Nuwabian property, five children were taken into Sheriff Seal's custody without express or written consent of their parents, nor defect procedures were followed. They took the children and they put them in defects custody. Mind you, they didn't even literally take them to the DFAX facility. They just took them somewhere and kept them. Right, without the parents without the knowing parents or just anything. anything. They literally just they took them. five children. Long story short, the children were proven by the state of Georgia, Judge Spivey, mm -hmm. to have never been molested. But then they remained in DFAX custody. But then they remained in DFAX custody. For months on end afterwards. Yes. And not only that, they left these five children who were stated and proven to not have been molested by the state of Georgia, Judge Spivey's ruling, and still kept them in the indictment as to have being molested. Not only that, they sealed the records of the ruling of the, ruling of the children to not have been uh, molested according to the state of Georgia. I went objectively straight at this thing and, and say, okay, if I was the initial responding officer to a call that child molestation is happening at 404 Shadell Road, what would I have done? According to the procedures that govern Georgia law enforcement officials, because you gotta remember, this started with Sheriff Seals, who went to the GBI, who went to the FBI. See what I'm saying? So the root of this wrong, you start wrong, you end wrong. You see what I'm saying? At the root, this thing was corrupt and bogus from the beginning. Garland's whole tone changed. I don't know if he had to sit down with someone who was like, but it, changed. it changed. It changed 100%. For the next several months, the Garland, Samuel, and Loeb firm, along with Frank Rubino and Associates, would spearhead their own clients' coercion in depleting the organization's finances. for a 
filing against this firm, the Garland Law Firm, for ineffective counsel, assistance to counsel, he said he thinks it's a ploy that just started that day. On the torture end of it, he was constantly denied sleep and constantly uh, questioned and harassed for 24 hours straight. Through the night. Yeah. Prior to making the plea. So he made that plea under duress. Even in the beginning, um, the plea, Garland came to him, because um, I don't know if a lot of people would know, but the Garland firm is known for plea deals. The plea agreement, mm -hmm. and before I already said, I don't trust them, I don't want to work with them. And they just kept hiding. They actually shackled me and made me come out to the phone. They would actually come to me and put me in shackles and drive me to the phone and talk to Garland while he reiterates, you must take a plea. It's better for you to take a plea. In a sense, you suffer like this. You're facing a thousand years. I'll never be able to win this case. I've had cases like this before. Why do you let these other girls suffer? Why do you let these people suffer? Don't think about yourself. If you was my son, that I would do this for you. I would tell you to do this. He was working all the time with them, and I knew it. Cause I knew they had no case. I knew there was no such thing in those videos. I knew the witness they talked about. I knew this was all a big plot. Garland basically comes to him like, you need to take this plea. He works out a plea deal with the prosecution. Uh, prosecutions like, uh, will let all the other people go mm -hmm. if he takes this plea. Doc Star's like, no, we'll just fight it, we can fight it, we can win it, we can win it. And he didn't want to fight this case because he was made a deal with them. Took over a million point five, but as I'm told by my sister, in cash money from my, from our, from our uh, tribe and flaunted it and didn't even use it. Never intended on having a trial, but intended to put their bogus plea. But they knew I wasn't going to take a plea, so they had to torture me into taking a plea. Kathy Johnson, Khadija Merritt, Chandra Lumpkin, and Astaire Cole was originally on the indictment as victims, stating nothing ever happened. Once they agreed not to become co-conspirators against York, they became co-defendants along with him. Now you have to think, these are mothers that were taken away from their children. Chandra Lumpkin's daughter was still breastfeeding. She, not even a year old, a baby, and put in jail. Um, Khadija uh, Merritt, uh, son, three, about maybe. three, yeah, Two about, three years old yeah, you know, um, uh, or, or Kathy Johnson, who suffers, um, she has a hereditary illness where, you know, she needs uh, medical help not to be sitting in a jail cell. I was told that they were being, being treated the same way I'm treated. That means I was sleeping on a concrete floor with real pork bad food, wasn't getting my medication, watching rats and roach bugs and stuff in the midst of cr very dangerous criminals. Murder Kathy suffering from MS, which is a very, very dangerous disease. I, I said, they're not giving me my medicine. Hers is brain deteriorating. She'll be crippled for life. They used that, not to mention starvation, uh, in, uh, sleep degradation, where they kept waking me up, uh, no allowed to telephone calls, interfering with my mail, you know, the, I mean, poor, definitely a poor diet, and, you know, a whole bunch of things, and just outright vulgar and physical abuse. The last straw was when uh, Rochelle, Rochelle York came with the attorneys and the attorney said, okay, look, final, this is the deal. They'll let everybody go. Um, you'll be able to speak to your people one more time and you have to tell them that everything that you've taught for 30 years was a lie. Take the deal. They kept battling that. This is why it took a week. They, it was like, no, forget it. Dr. York is just like, they're all in jail because somebody is angry at me. And so, what choice did he have? Their lives were pendulant upon him agreeing to a guilty plea. It was a setup. It was a setup from the door. So, once the government didn't take the plea, they didn't take the plea because during the plea deal, which is in the transcripts, the judge involved himself in it like, gave an idea which would be a better amount of time to give Dr. York. And that's biasness. And that's when Lawson took himself off of the case because he showed complete biasness by involving himself, giving his opinion on Dr. York. We began to probe, we found out the sheriff's seals controls the Eaton Messenger. You're not going to get it uh, a 
fair disclosure or an objective disclosure of the case against Dr. York through these messages. You weren't going to get it through the Macon Telegraph. You weren't going to get it through Channel 24. You weren't going to get it through Channel 13. These are all the major media mediums of Central Georgia. You weren't going to get it out of them because of either Sheriff Seals or the rest of the good old boy circuit's influence over these networks or newspapers or radio stations or what have you. Adrian Patrick was um, eager to do it. He was like, okay, I'll prepare us for trial then. But the key thing with him is he came in December 17th? Right, hearing? like with two weeks. He came in on December 17th, 2003. Mm -hmm. The trial ended up being January of 2004. So when he came on and, and Aurora and the Garland Firm was released, he requested a continuance because he needed time to prepare for trial. He needs to go. There are boxes and boxes and boxes of discovery material full of files. Because mind you, this is from 2002 to the winter of 2003. There's tons of court documents. It's a very complex case. Witnesses to interview. All these things go into preparation for trial. And he was expected to do the, all that basically in a month and a half span. So he requested a continuance and it was denied. So all of, automatically from the door coming into the trial, Dr. York was placed at an enormous disadvantage because he had to cram in a year and a half work of, worth of work in weeks. See, the public don't know this. The judge called them in chamber and turned to Reverend York and said, I knew you were going to pull something like this. Why do you care? You're supposed to be an objective observer in a situation where he'll be tried by his peers. They made him go forward with the trial. Here's the trick the game the judge played. He said, um, I'm not going to let you release Manny Aurora. How are you going to tell Dr. York? He's saying, I don't want this guy. This guy is not working in my best interest. The Constitution protects my right to legal counsel, who's obligated to fight on my behalf. This guy ain't got a witness ready seven days before trial. He needs to go. The judge says no. And that was a game they played to not allow the continuance. Then as soon as the trial started, the judge allowed Manny Aurora off the case. Witnesses who came forward to testify regarding the, the conspiracy involving Jake York, people who were on the trip to South Beach where the whole plot was formulated, people who lived in the house with Jake, who were a party to all these plans weren't even allowed to testify because they knew if they testified, they're not even going to allow the conspiracy in because that's the key to the whole case. That blows the case wide open. That's something the media doesn't want anybody to know, the, the judges and the prosecution doesn't want anybody to know. That would have been blown wide open. They're not allowed to testify. Jacob York was very upset at his father and I know that's why um, he told the government that uh, his father, you know, was uh, wrong and was molesting children so that he could obtain money from his father because he was out there doing illegal activities, um, illegal identification, birth certificates, or what have you. Also, he was a record producer, uh, not a very good one because uh, he's always having problems with his artists, but um, yet and still, you know, he was upset with his father, which didn't make any sense, you know. Unfortunately, his mother had passed, you know, peace be with her, um, but he shouldn't have been mad at his father, Dr. Malachi Z. York, because he had nothing to do with it. The testimonies of the alleged victims was ridiculous. The lack of evidence, eight out of 13 alleged victims in the indictment testified that nothing happened to them. Six of the seven who were said to have been molested currently during the time of the arrest of Dr. York testified for Dr. York. Five of them were proven by state agencies and judge order to have been completely uh, not abused in no way, shape, or form, physically, mentally, sexually. They testified on behalf of Dr. York. The lead prosecution witness recanted her story. What more did the world need to see that this man has been completely railroaded? One of them is my sister, as a matter of fact. You know what I'm saying? Safia LaRoche. Mm -hmm. You know, she made these accusations as well. 
you know what I'm saying, against Dr. Malaka as a York. Not only did I testify against her accusation, but also her mother testified against her accusations. You know, and I spoke with her best friend at the time, who told me that she felt bad about saying these things. But later, you know, like I said, she's she's the type of person who is easily influenced. I mean, it was so bad when we were sitting and we were watching the the trial was closed to the public. It was only in, in terms of sitting into in the actual gallery of the court. You could only watch from closed circuit television. We sat up there and saw. So he had no support. Yeah, he had no support. And you see government witness after witness. These people couldn't even keep their story straight. I mean, they were clearly lying, clearly making up, can't remember the locations, dates, places. I mean, they couldn't even remember statements they had made to the FBI about this whole case. They were clearly lying. I mean, it, to, to sit there and watch it, that's why they wanted the courtroom closed. They don't want people to see the nonsense and the, the ridiculousness that they put up. It was a kangaroo court. The people were clearly lying. They couldn't keep things straight. They, they, I mean, it was, it was really ridiculous to watch. Salha Eddington, who is my cousin, you know what I'm saying, was after being abducted by defects, was taken into the custody of her father, you know, who also testified against Malachi York, who influenced her to testify against Malachi York because before that she used to communicate with me a lot. She used to call me at my house and she used to let me know what was going on in there and how they treated her. You know what I'm saying? And then one day I got a call thinking it was her and it was the father on the line and he said, you can't talk to her anymore. And that was the last time I spoke to her at that time. The next time I saw her was in Brunswick, Georgia when she testified against Malachi York, you know? So they got to her eventually. So this whole thing was plotted and coerced by people who were disgruntled and they were tools used. So it's so many instances of when you saw the judicial bias from Judge Royal constantly blocking Attorney Patrick. Everything he puts up is denied, overruled. I mean, it was, it was clearly, he's pointing out evidence that the prosecution needs to mention in the case. Why didn't you mention this? How can a judge sit there and coach the prosecution from the bench? And these are things that were happening throughout the trial that people don't know about because subsequently the transcripts were sealed. So people couldn't even find out what actually happened. After the, the prosecution has maybe a week and a half of putting up witnesses, the judge rushes Attorney Patrick's witnesses saying that they're repetitive and we don't have time after it's been a week and a half of the prosecution witnesses, but now, oh no, we don't have time. Too many of your witnesses are repetitive. So he's, you know, he showed a clear biasness against Dr. York. But despite that, Attorney Patrick still put on witness after witness of people who could attest to Dr. York's character, who could attest that none of this happened, all these so-called alleged victims who got up there and said, this did not happen to me. We even had uh, Issa Johnson, who's supposedly supposed to testify on behalf of the prosecution, get up there and say, nothing happened. So all these people who are in, in the indictment are saying nothing happened, how is there how they're getting guilty counts, uh, getting guilty on counts pertaining to people who were there who said nothing happened. They said it didn't happen. So why are you getting a guilty verdict on people who said this didn't happen to me? I went to the trial and I seen it. They never produced any evidence. Don't believe me, check it out. You will find out there isn't a shred of physical evidence against Dr. Malakazi York to this day. Not a doctor's examination, not a picture of the act, not any videotapes of the act, not any DNA samples that were used or presented as evidence during trial, nothing. Not even a testimony that he did it but destroyed the sheets every time or something, nothing. Nothing. Judge C. Ashley Royal stood up, recharged the jury, and sent them back in to deliberate.
So this jury was never presented any sound evidence that proved that Dr. Malachi York was a criminal and that the Nawabian organization is a corrupt organization dubbed a criminal enterprise that warranted the RICO charge. Miraculously, because of the help of people who did lead research, who worked on the case, Attorney Patrick still won the case. He won the trial in terms of presenting the facts of the case. It got pulled off because of the work of members of the organization, people who have been re researching, who pulled it off. But to be placed in that position legally, he was automatically placed at a disadvantage that wasn't fair to Dr. York. A young lady named Habiba Washington, who has a child with Dr. Malachi York, she became the star witness to corroborate all of the lies in this bogus indictment against Dr. York. Everybody started venting in, in the car about different things that we didn't like. It didn't have nothing to do with child molestation, had nothing to do with any criminal acts. It was just different things that, you know, normal things that you don't like about growing up or, you, you know, we might have had an argument with Malachi here and there and we brought up the situation. Jake, Jacob kind of fed off of that anger and um, he convinced all of us that we should take that anger and we should go to the government with a story about his father. And I, I implore, again, I implore everybody to go to he'sinnocent.com and look at the indictment, look at Habiba's involvement, things like that. And then the bombshell happens where the most powerful weapon the prosecution had recants her statement. In terms of money structuring, which is one of the main counts against York, Habiba Washington testified repetitively. She was never given any instructions to structure money as the chief financer from York or anyone in the Nuwabian community. I told them about life in the community, growing up, um, why we left. Um, I was questioned about the money charges. I mean, the money situation, because I, deal, I did deal with the financial situation. I told them how we ran our finances. Um, I ran off, you know, different people that I knew that was there different people that I knew that had left and why they left. You know, several times, she diligently and adamantly wanted to state to the world that everything I said during the trial against Dr. Malachi York was a lie. The whole trial against Malachi was a personal, it was on personal anger reasons. Um, we all had our own issues, why we were angry with him. Um, and Jacob told us that we can come up with a story, we could eventually file for a class action lawsuit, we can all sue him for millions of dollars and get money from it, we can even go to making movies, we can even go to making books and stuff like that. So everybody fed off of that idea. She laid out the conspiracy from beginning to end. How it was conceived by the son of Dr. York, known as Jacob York or Yaqub Abdullah Muhammad by some who grew up with him. But you know, to the layman, it's Jacob York, the, the big guy in entertainment in Atlanta right now. Laid it out, made her study the Watergate Jew, made her study Jim Jones, made certain other of the alleged victims who we know are liars study these things so they can profile the Nawabians the same way they profile other extremist cults so they can line it up. She lays the whole conspiracy out. Prior to Jacob telling us about um, the civil suit, he showed us um, video documentary on Charles Manson, on um, the Watergate Jude, um, different, different leaders that kind of ran cults, and Jacob showed us this documentary, he showed it to me, he showed it to Nicole, he basically showed it to everybody that left the community, the girls. Um, and he wanted us to look at this documentary and compare it to his father, the way that we lived. The fact that, yes, we did live with the children, with the children, the parents with the parents, the, the brothers together, the, the mothers together. He wanted us to compare 
everything that they've been through with us so that we can start believing, we can put in our minds that no, we didn't live a normal life. Yes, we were a cult. And then in conclusion states, everything that was stated on that stand was a lie. And if anybody knows how you recant in a proper fashion as far as the attorney present, the uh, affidavits, things like that, this lady, this young lady and her, she officially withdrew everything she said about Dr. York. She outlined other alleged victims' involvement. She outlined the original brainchild of this thing, which was Dr. York's son, Jacob York. A new trial hearing was held on August 13, 2004. The unimaginable took place. Defense counsel Jonathan Marks withdraws Abigail Washington's recantment and Reverend York's motion for a new trial, along with a motion of judgment for acquittal filed by Adrian Patrick. Abigail is threatened by Marks and FBI agents to recant her recantment as she is called to testify by defense counsel. York is amazed as she recants crying on the stand. Reverend York files a motion to withdraw Jonathan Marks as an attorney due to ineffective assistance of counsel. The 476-acre property was sold for $1.1 million to a local Millersville developer, who later resold the property as stated by the Sheriff's Department for restitution that none of the alleged victims received. I would love and challenge Max Woods, Moultrie, Jelaine Ward, Stephanie Docker, Sheriff Seals, you get on that end of the table, and I'll stand on this end of the table, and let's present our facts as to whether Dr. York is innocent or guilty. Pay-per-view. All proceeds go to the winner. Anything I've been through since then was worth the time I spent on the land and the time we're going to spend together again with Dr. York when the community comes back together. It's, it's, it's nothing like it in the world. For Nubian people, there is no place like Tamaray in the world. There's no organization like this in the world. Dr. Malachi York is innocent, and Dr. Malachi York needs to be freed now. That's what I have to say. You know, and for the world, and for those who's watching, I hope this never happened to you. Because then, then you'll see. You know what I'm saying? You'll see how, how they do us. He's innocent. And I'll never stand for anything else except his innocence. Because I know better. That's what I have to say. In the face of adversity and scrutiny, Dr. Reverend Malachi Z. York in the Nuwabian community continues to carry on in the fight to proclaim his innocence. Many so-called experts believe that their way of life would dwindle, erasing its culture away as just some fad. However, the Nuwabian community continues with public functions, fundraisers, and local community works. Reverend York is everything but a serial pedophile, which is still yet to be fairly contested in a court of law or public opinion. Disputing his character may be easy for some, but to dispute his efforts is inevitable. Raising the conscious level of people of color in the Western world and abroad to a new way of thinking is inevitable in a span of 40 years. Doing for self and kind, living for and by one another creates an inferiority complex amongst the majority rule in the Western world. The adversities against liberation may slow down the group, but it will never stop change, that which is constant in the name of freedom. In 1999, Malachi York denounced his American citizenship and became a full nationalized Liberian citizen, enjoying all its rights and benefits. Since his arrest in 2002, the United States government has ignored his request to return to Liberia.